Hello everyone, today we talk about 14th and 15th century Irish tactics. Um, and I've, I've already addressed a bit of, um, of Irish uh, warfare back in the day with two videos. The first one is Medieval Irish Warrior, 12th to 13th century. The other one is actually about Scottish history, but it, it has a certain fallout on, on Irish warfare definitely as well. That is West Highlanders weapons and armor from the 14th to the 16th century. It also from, from timeline can actually sticks to our own today. But relatively to this last point, actually, we will see how uh, even giving this narrower um, time focus towards the end of the Middle Ages, actually, medieval Irish wa um, warfare in the essentials, at least in this uh, phase between after the, the, the 11th to 12th century to the uh, up to the end of the Middle Ages is actually pretty uh, pretty similar. I mean, it's characterized by certain constant features that are some somewhat also distinctive of Irish Irish uh, warfare uh, proper. And um, I also haven't addressed to to this day uh, anything about the uh, Irish or you want to prefer Gaelic uh, military organization, we will do it another time. Today we will stick, as we were saying, chiefly to tactics. And these other videos that I just mentioned to you, it's kind of always do it to, to say where, whenever there is something similar uh, in topic, in, 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 in theme that I've already made, can be useful as either an introduction or a um, as a complement or a completion, where, whatever you, you know, you, for for this for this video itself. So, um, as we were saying now, the um, the essentials of Irish warfare are important to be framed, generally speaking. Um, Irish warfare at this time uh, fundamentally can be summarized it was was centered as the the warfare of many other uh, peoples in, around the world on cattle raiding. Ireland leaves uh, yeah, in this time uh, the, 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 the fringe, in fact, of civilization was a rather uh, primitive country compared to other even neighboring uh, entities just thinking about England, the development of its monarchy, its uh, relative centralization for the time, etc. And in fact, um, I, I think one of the most interesting um, chapters of, of medieval military history is in this meeting between the, the Anglo-Normans and 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 the Gaels, uh, with the especially with the invasion of of Ireland, the English invasion of Ireland in uh, in, the, in the early 12th century under Henry Henry II, and this um, and and this is interesting because it it gives uh, it's one of I can't say very rare cases in in, in medieval warfare, but when when you have sensibly differing uh, military systems that meet and you can spot in this sense the differences and highlighting them always given that fundamentally these systems kind of became an hybrid we will see it today we will talk about uh, both Irish tacti tactics proper of the uh, local guiles but also on of how the uh, the English dealt uh, with them because uh, as you know, uh, at this point, in fact, as we just said, the English uh, set foot into Ireland. They organized even a, a local military uh, administration, and re they, they also draw from the same, from a train, the same guiles, uh, not just techniques or weapons, but in fact, the the same, uh, the same warriors, because that's how also it, it, it always happens at the end of the day. I mean, before actually being able to, to, to. To emulate one of your enemies, the, the, the quickest, quickest thing that happens and also favors that is hiring local mercenaries and stuff like that. Um, to summarize, also in here, um, a, a, a prominent figure of Irish warfare this time is the consistent lack of cavalry. Um, this is stressed by many sources. In my opinion, it's probably overly stressed. I don't think that the Irish actually lacked cavalry at all because it's a very radical statement, of course. We have we have plenty of evidence of uh, Gaelic cavalry being used. Uh, it just seems that for some reason that we're going to explain now it was rather you know uh, underdeveloped at least compared to especially and, and now uh, obviously as you can imagine to the heavier um, English cavalry that that stemmed from a feudal society that evidently the the, the Irish uh, didn't have and this is something that the 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 whole Celtic fringe has in common at uh, this time. I mean, but also the Welsh and the Scots uh, didn't make uh, 
a considerable use of cavalry, um, especially compared to, to the English. And um, this is explainable for, for many reasons. For, first of all, um, you can't talk about the 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 I without any precedence in in importance about the environment. First of all, uh, considering the Irish terrain that at this time is a uh, very difficult uh, ground to fight in. It's an area covered in woods with many. Uh, uh, very, uh, you know, that uh, medieval society expands, even uh, feudal society and, and its military system goes on, even literally expanding and modifying the, the landscape of certain lands. So, when um, the feudal armies went fighting to lands that were not, kind of not fitting, even for, in fact, for uh, pitched battles where heavy cavalry was best preferably used, they had considerable dif difficulties, and this made the locals. Um, substantially advantage because they could create uh, great um, difficulties to the uh, to the heavy uh, cavalry just by exploiting the uh, terrain features and definitely obtaining a, a substantial tactical advantage over horsemen. But as a consequence, Ireland was a relatively a relatively uh, primitive country. It was poor fundamentally. Didn't have many resources. And uh, and therefore the local society had remained um, for very much um, can't say uncontaminated, but it, it it was much more it was still essentially a clanic society. Mm -hmm. uh, it resembled much more just for by a pros approximation and migration era society rather than a a, a high or low medieval one at this point. Um, and it's very interesting, we have observed it uh, also in the video on the West Highlanders, um, that uh, in fact while uh, feudal Europe was developing in its uh, you know, military uh, in a certain way, passaging, uh, pa passing through stages and um, uh, evolving etc., these uh, worlds uh, at the, the margins of Europe kind of remained a bit on their own, and, uh, and not just because um, and you don't have to see it necessarily as a condition of inferiority of some kind, because eventually these uh, systems were uh, pretty much flexible in many ways. They were actually even more open to um, to to learning more than you know more structured uh, uh, systems were, like the, the Central Europeans one. And even though they they objectively didn't develop, in fact, at, at the end, especially Ireland itself, a uh, uh, consistent uh, political entities. I mean, that uh, at least considering now, especially towards the end of the Middle Ages, what was happening in, in, in not just in continental Europe but in England as well, this more uh, robust uh, pre-modern uh, states, uh, pre-modern monarchies, uh, they uh, they were still capable, in fact, of playing their cards well and also keeping uh, invaders uh, out of it. Uh, the the Irish had. Uh, throughout all their medieval history and beyond, definitely this um, these aggressions that uh, uh, um, quite evidently um, molded their 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 warfare. Mm -hmm. uh, at, at the end, at the very beginning of this, uh, I don't know, by the eleventh century, we, we talk uh, fundamentally even in warfare about a. a uh, Iberno Norse society, mm -hmm. the impact of Vikings also in Scotland and other. Uh, surrounding areas were were was definitely uh, important, and because the the Giles had mutuated uh, tactics, uh, weaponry, in uh, te military techniques, and uh, and so on, uh, from from the the, the Norse, from the the their own foes. Um, so this happens in part also naturally in this time with with contacts with the, with England. Uh, with Scotland, that is a bit of an hybrid of the two things, because also Scotland is developing its kingdom very slowly, but you know is is getting kind of westernized or Frankicized, or you wanna you wanna call it, um, given the continental models that had also uh, molded the same English, uh, the same English military system uh, at this point. Um, and um, if you go back to the famous uh, Giraldus uh, Cambrensis, you can um, um, fundamentally uh, sum up uh, 
the uh, Irish tactics in, w through his words, where he says, the Irish have no interest in castles, but use the woods as their fortresses and the marshes as their entrenchments. Naturally, here, Gerald is kind of, uh, it's kind of, uh, you know, uh, ideal. It's not that the Irish didn't have interest in castles. It's simply that they lacked the means to, to build some um, that could be comparable to the uh, to the military engineering the the uh, the, the English now had, uh, but uh, in fact the, he, they use votes and uh, as their fortresses. So this gives the, even this pictorial idea of the votes as something tall as a forest in the marshes as their entrenchments. So this kind of more uh, you know flat uh, uh, obstacles that nevertheless were so uh, effective. Um, and definitely this practice of erecting barricades uh, across woodland passes, especially long tracks and so on, is uh, something you find as a constant at this time in, in Irish warfare, for, for sure. And um, these um, barricades were used definitely, uh, as you can understand, as a uh, defensive mean, uh, from which, uh, behind, behind which the, the Irish could uh, ambush or harass the enemy with missiles and so on. These are tactics that you can find basically in, in many other peoples, in many other countries um, that have incidentally that kind of, um, of stage of, de uh, of development in, in terms of uh, you know, their, their society and even those same um, uh, environmental uh, the, the same terrain, for instance. So if you go back in, in some century, if you look at Germany, if you look at Eastern Europe, Northern Europe, you, you find that this kind of, of tactics were pretty much used also, also in there. Uh, here they were still prevalent in, in many ways, whereas in other areas feudalism had kind of broken these barriers from a political and social point of view before then than just a strictly military one. Uh, nevertheless, they were still very effective in that particular environment. Yeah of Ireland. And so just imagine, in fact, having to, to go through these woodlands and having to, to, in fact, to certain tracks you have kind of road necessary to follow and to find um, barricade and entrenchment uh, one after the other with these uh, fast-moving warriors armed with, chiefly with missiles, they're extremely agile and flexible, etc., that can uh, have, carry out this very fluid and dynamic uh, bombardment with javelins, with stones, with stuff like that, um, and uh, and having to to go through it one after one, and this is kind of devastating, even from a psychological point of view. Um, and this uh, general re reliance on woods um, that let's remi remind it once again at this time really covered a large part of Ireland uh, at this time, also were a very a very useful refuge. Mm -hmm. uh, even, especially given that, uh, as we were beginning to say before, uh, Irish military organization was relatively uh, simple. It was still kind of clanic based. It was an aggregation of all these various uh, uh, groups, uh, client tales of, of, of warriors that uh, kind of cooperated more or less one with another. Actually, the Irish were uh, fighting not just against outsiders, but chiefly uh, against each other, as always in this very, uh, you know, evidently fragmented political situation. Um, but, and, and therefore, um, from a tactical point of view, this translated in a greater fluidity for which every kind of group uh, moved on its own. And, uh, and this was um, kind of uh, useful when you had to carry out this guerrilla warfare and creating problems to instead other armies like the English ones that instead relied on this the, the compactness of their uh, of their formations that uh, at that point were kind of they didn't have any kind of mass to target but they were surrounded by this um, endless series of uh, small uh, groups that harassed them continuously so this as long of course as uh, the meeting uh, the, the, the the fight w w happened in in a closed ground in forest and something like that in open field, it was really a problem for the Irish to meet, say, heavy cavalry, for, for instance. Um, but they also had their means in the world. See now, um, these barricades that we have, uh, so taking refuge in the view, in the woods, and uh, it's very it's very convenient to scatter and you and and getting into ground where 
cavalry can can reach you and from there eventually coming out so it, it also involves naturally a this is typical guerrilla warfare it is based more on harassment and continuous harassment and also this psychological pressure deriving from the a refusal of um you know for 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 the uh for whoever advances in such an environment uh, trying to to fight the refusal of the fight but just a constant pressure for a we will see now with, with other witnesses that we will quote that will bring to to to, an, to a moral exhaustion to a psychological exhaustion on, on the enemy the um the also the means uh through which barricades were built were very simple also in here drawn from very uh, from from nature itself um sometimes it was enough to use uh nothing more than than a few felled trees uh this is the case for instance of strong bows advance with in in the, at the pass of Odron in 1171 so we're going back a little in time but that's a nice example um but uh sometimes there was uh, there was a bit more of a sophistication with uh something more complex like uh, constructed um uh, i mean barricades uh, barricades constructed of undergrowth and branches plashed together into dense wattle screens so uh this is also typical of many other many other peoples who use this kind of simple but yet yet effective um uh, defense in, in in that environment um the um the song of Dermot and the earl is um provides with such a uh, another interesting uh, evidence of this um the song of Dermot and the earl is essentially uh, just if you want to search it is is a uh, anonymous anglo-norman verse chronicle written by the way uh, in uh, early 13th century england and uh, it 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 tells about the arrival of the strongbow uh, in Ireland uh, that that is uh, titled as early in the title, and eventually the the arrival the consequent arrival of Henry the Second of England because you know how if you know the story uh, basically they they the Ang the English kind of uh, initially backed this um, the reinsertion of certain uh, Irish exiles that had fled into England so and then eventually. Uh, intervening themselves in first in first person of the king himself by the way um and in there um in this um work we have the um uh, the king uh Der Dermot of Osroy actually ordering his men to throw up a high wide rampart steep and large and to strengthen it with stakes at the back and with hurdles at the front mm -hmm um and um the, there could this this defenses could be uh, barricades and ditches at the same time so increasing the um the difference in um in uh, you know having to not just to to assault the, the high wall but also having a ditch you have to go down to for, to to attack it from so in increasing uh the the difference in height uh, or the drop I don't know how, how you call it uh, in English, and um, there are many other uh, events of this. Um, the there the could that excuse me. There are many there is many other evidence of this. Sometimes this could be simply larger, more concentrated barricades in a single place, or could be a more often actually a series of um, barricades and ditches that were built in in depth mm -hmm. so along a track having several uh, several of these uh, fortifications and this I, I don't know when when i think about this i always think about how the, the battle of the teutoborg force back in the day had been fought you had, the germans had built this series of of barricades that the romans stormed uh, once after one to get out of the ambush and eventually this there was this uh, larger one at the end that um and that was functional in this way so it's not that these barricades were impreg impregnable were actually pretty much uh, easy to storm especially if you had uh pretty determined and sometimes heavily armored troops because let's not forget that feudal contingents do not fight just mounted the uh, actually the the military the english military history in this time of the middle ages against the in two um, in the episodes that took place in the celtic fringe in fact uh show us this the, the great flexibility also in 
in feudal contingents of uh, of the militias of, of the knights that could dismount and engage uh, on foot and adapting in therefore also into this context but definitely was way more risky and we have this evidence even in 1103 of um, uh, from the Heim uh, Skringla uh, saga where, where King Magnus uh, Berlegs of, of Norway is killed actually in an Irish um, ambush um, in in a bog uh, when fundamentally he was surrounded by the Irish that, that jump up on every side and every uh, from every bush every uh, conceal and uh, and Magnus was incidentally killed uh, by a um, Irish ox uh, which uh, hit on his neck uh, when exactly he had managed to to reach the, the last of the ditches that the, the Giles had 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 built to 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 slow down the Norwegian uh, advance, and um, that uh, was particularly difficult to cross, impassable, uh, in fact, uh, as the last one, and where in fact he was killed uh, eventually. Um, so, um, generally speaking, there was a given the lack of segmentation in Irish society at this point. Um, there was definitely a sorry I'm checking the mic yeah sorry um, there was definitely a a great homogeneity in the typology of, of troops that the Irish uh, used that's why that video on uh, medieval Irish warrior is pretty between the 12th and 13th centuries kind of pretty pretty uh, general in this sense because uh, there was really kind of very uh, unique or, uh, type of, of, of fighter that was this essentially this light uh, uh, actually unarmored most of the times um, uh, warrior that mastered you know it was pretty agile knew how to use uh, spears javelins something like that was expert of moving in the woods and stuff and yeah of course you you can find the various uh, specializations that naturally every every single individual can can have there was surely some degree of uh, uh, also i believe temporally chronologically throughout this period a kind of evolution increasing specialization but fundamentally the the majority of the irish uh, warriors was made up by this very standard uh, typology of troop fundamentally so except for the older um heavier armored um ostmen mm -hmm. uh, so in 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 Norse uh, in in the Bern of Norse warfare this uh, kind of viking style mm, you know heavier guys with usually ar armor and uh double hand uh, axe and stuff like that and later the, the galloglag um that kind of had both preferred to fight in the open uh, in close order or tendentially in close order because also in here, the, the you know the, the close order is the, is relative. Uh, the majority of Irish troops prefer to fight as lightly armed, mm. and depending, tactically speaking, heavily on such uh, on the, the ambushes that we have just described, and um, that definitely gave them an edge because coupled with the knowledge of the terrain, um, uh, these tactics were kind of very difficult even to counter because fundamentally they were based on this contest, constant skirmishing and on the possibility of withdrawing uh, virtually uninjured because uh, th these were the uh, the best <laughs> fighters that could fight uh, could could um, in fact the, the best warriors that could fight on that ground that type of ground and nobody could match them in terms of, of mobility and knowledge of the terrain and so on that is very very important at the same time there were certain limits that now we will also observe because definitely in open ground things uh, tended to to change pretty much um, as um, definitely anglo-norman cavalry uh, could not be matched by the uh, by the Irish at this point uh, probably uh, whichever Irish contingent uh, was used in open ground when it was tendentially definitely heavier than the average um, than the average um, Irish uh, armies um, and in fact probably tended to 
uh, to have to deploy uh, warriors like the Galog likes that were specialized in this uh, melee uh, combat, but at the same time were relatively um, untrained in the sense that they were definitely trained individually. You know, I mean, they were excellent individual warriors. They they knew how to 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 fence very well, but you know, in terms of collective training they weren't much of a thing. They were actually at this time you, we we find that the Gallog Lake is also evolving, is uh, is even being exported as a model uh not just of um fighting style but but also of military organization. This is between the fourteenth and fifteenth century the moment in which the, the Gallog Lake is uh, is, uh, is is being organized in these companies that you find uh, in, in the market of warfare now, pretty much all over Europe, um, the uh, definitely the the Gallog like you know that that it simply means um, foreign warrior. Mm -hmm. uh, th there was actually a not even heavy uh, trooper. It, it was usually medium heavy heavy foot soldier uh, coming originally from the Western Isles. And the and, and the west coast of Scotland, as we've seen in the previous videos on the Highlanders, but by the 15th century, actually, also included elements, uh, uh, actually native Irish uh, elements, because this is arguably um, this was increasing as as a phenomenon, definitely in this time. From in, in um, also because Ireland slower was also developing on its own, it had definitely uh, sort of progress and obviously very gradual but it could start to feel even this kind of a heavier uh, troops there, there is a, a sort of feudalization in part of of Irish warfare this time in, 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 in the surface for which the elite tended now to uh, imitate or to fight in, in with the style or with the weapons and armor of the of the Frankish derived uh, troops of kind of the now what was the western uh, uh, warfare in feudal Europe, um, and and this is important to stress is just a, a tendency, an acceleration, but that in Irish warfare that had o there had always been, as we have seen before with the Ostmen, uh, even before the Gallo like coming from Scotland, uh, this kind of heavier troops that naturally even in in the clanic. Uh, uh, in the uh, Gaelic clanic society existed as the elite, whereas they were usually chieftains and so on. And very often, in fact, the, the only the only troopers that could afford things like an armor or or even a a sword uh, this time were were definitely the the chieftains them, themselves. So that also had a monopoly on the on on violence, but by a certain a certain uh, sta individual standard. Uh, given that they had more offensive capabilities, um, so um, those troops definitely also start to 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 increase it, uh, in number uh, at this point, and uh, together with the probably the willingness of Irish um, warriors to engage uh, in open field. <laughs> Tendentially, but still preferring the usual, the traditional, um, the traditional tactics. So here it's not that it, because it was traditional they were using it just because they fancied being traditionalists. Then it doesn't war, warfare doesn't work like that. It's simply that the the, the local conditions were pretty much uh, unchangeable, and if there had been any possible progress, they, they would have definitely uh, achieved that. So that same thing we were commenting on. When we're talking about the West Highlanders, you realize that uh, such uh, kind of troops with double-handed swords and, and 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 something like that survived until the, even the 17th century. So there, there were fundamentally warriors that fought in full medieval style, if there is anything can be defined with such name. Still in the 17th century, where there were muskets, where there were warfare in in other areas of Europe now, and actually in the rest of Europe almost now. Uh, had completely completely changed, but for that environment, the local traditions were still effective and even uh, a match I in that context for for other more 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 developed armies. And um, let me check here. 
Yes. So, um, what we were saying here is that the um, how did the first of all let's talk uh, at how uh, how the Anglo Normans up to that point had coped with Irish tactics. So fundamentally, they had uh, maintained their naturally their core uh, element. Uh, their, their, the core of their armies was represented by heavy cavalry, by the knights that had also not just this military but also political commitment, etc. Um, in, in, in invading Ireland and size, uh, seizing it, it, its lands and so on. But now, given this uh, Irish reliance on missile troops, chiefly now, um, in the the English made extensive use of archers in Ireland. We know that the, on on some occasions. Um, Irish armies were uh, were bled white by uh, simply by uh, the fire of uh, English arrows at, at this point. Um, seemingly here, the archery in Ireland was not particularly developed. Um, the uh, the contact with the English in here probably also started developing something more um, consistent on, on that ground, but. You know the evidence for Irish archery is kind of it, it, it's there, but it's not that the, that that it seemingly that there was a particular development of these tactics. And archery against this um, lighter, this light um, Irish warriors was particularly effective because uh, this was uh, uh, a way to counter them on the distance with with missile weapons that had fundamentally a longer range than javelins and stones that were fundamentally all what the Irish um, used. Um, cavalry naturally had this evident um, advantage of being fast. Um, the um, and, um, and 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 for this role, actually, usually foreign mercenaries were used by the English. Usually it was Welsh cavalry, <coughs> being usually lighter than the English feudal one, to be used in order to, to pursue the, the, the enemy. And that's kind of a good reason, because you don't, you don't want to... a good solution, because you don't want to waste your heavy uh, cavalry into, you know, in, into, uh, you know, pursuing operations, because definitely um, that's not a, the type of cavalry that can sustain such an effort uh, heavy cavalry is in fact heavy horses are meant to give this are selected in their breeds for giving this extra powerful uh, performance in, 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 a, in a short moment that is essentially just the one of the charge they're not made, made for running and, and, and definitely when you you pursue the enemy. You tend also to to scatter all around. This is that is particularly um, risky uh, for an elite like heavy cavalry uh, at this time, because um, it's kind of easier to ambush. And when it's um, it, it doesn't work in a single formation, it kind of loses even its shock power, is deterrence, and, and so on. Um, the same Geraldus Cambrensis was uh, writing in his Conquest of Ireland that. The uh, the Anglo Normans fighting in Ireland uh, had to be particularly careful to ensure that archers were always incorporated in the mounted formations, so that the damage caused by stones with which the Irish usually attack heavily uh, attacked heavily armored troops at close range could be averted by volleys of arrows um, from from fact the English side. Um, the um, also, in, in this passage um, that we kind of skipped, the re, uh, it, uh, uh, Geraldus states that the Irish tactics consisted in this alternately rushing forward and, and retreating without loss to themselves, uh, because they were very mobile and they could they could achieve this. So um, it's also very interesting that the the way the Anglo Normans had started to cope with Irish warfare was essentially this combined tactics of heavy cavalry um, uh, and uh, archers that fundamentally 
paved the road uh, in this um, difficult Irish terrain, uh, also as explorers, as uh, as ambushers themselves, and in this sense probably also adapted to, to local war uh, warfare in many ways. And this is the tendency that happens in kind of every type of um, of context when you have heavy troops uh, kind of the elite and you don't waste them in operations where they they're they're gonna get uh, fundamentally worn down for for no reason when you have these lighter and cheaper troops that can perform even better those very uh, very tough tasks and um the, as we were saying before, uh, there is a very few evidence of um, Irish cavalry, and and the, the few one that existed kind of um, resembled. Um, it was pretty light tendentially. Uh, also, in here, the chieftain could definitely have a better equipment, sometimes even indistinguishable from the one of a Anglo-Norman knight, which was perfectly normal because the elites could afford, theory, just even a uh, you know at least one armor. And using it, so this um, idea that or also exists throughout the early Middle Ages, for which the British islands uh, hadn't developed much uh, cavalry, much it, it is true, but sometimes it's brought to the extremes. For saying that, you know, there was kind of no cavalry even the, among the Anglo-Saxons before the the arrival of Norman cavalry. But and the same Geraldus Cambrensis is actually responsible for having said this. Um, the third is more complex, and actually uh, we know that Mount we we can observe from several hints if you really go look them all in detail that that even in contexts like the Anglo-Saxon world or the Celtic fringe, uh, definitely cavalry was used, maybe not extensively. But it, both in numbers and in, and and um, you know with a great quality, but still it was a necessary and ineliminable tactical component of these ar uh, armies, as well. Um, it's often said that the uh, the um, uh, in fact most of these uh, mounted troops actually d uh, dismounted when they had to fight. Which is also a bit of a, an ideal statement because you know if if you have a horse and you know how to ride it, fundament and you're a warrior, you fundamentally know also how to fight on it. So it it, it doesn't actually make sense. Here there are naturally also certain cultural elements like the fact that yeah there was this, in fact in this m kind of more primitive um, cultures, still this kind of alleged th th this kind of a heroic style of fighting you know the idea that the the leader comes in the field and dismounts and and challenges the the enemy um it's a single combat and so on these are all beautiful ideals that definitely uh, uh, are closer to reality in these societies than than in others uh, in more developed ones that kind of evolved from their tribal originally tribal um um system fundamentally um but it's um in fact it's an ideal the reality is is very is very different the mm, uh, cavalry definitely was used also for specific tactics you can imagine also raiding or incursions that had to rely on on speed uh, and also this idea of getting out of there uh, before uh, there the, you know you could be overwhelmed by by other troops which was pretty much uh, alive um the uh we know that Irish cavalry for instance uh, the one of Breffney and and the horse, the horsemen of Breffney and Oriel as they are called by the sources um cut down the English cornfields during the siege of Dublin in 1171 so that's kind of a very good use for it also the fact that from the name from the sources we have the names of this single uh kind of you know, Breffney and Uriel as, as identified uh, as uh, horsemen um, tell you that uh, probably uh, that was kind of a not really a distinctive figure, but saying you know that cavalry was was not so widespread so that everybody had it. But here you had to 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 say to whom it belonged. Mm -hmm. So that kind of is kind of gives an idea. The Irish were known for riding without saddle nor stirrups or spores. Um, that is definitely a 
pretty evident indicator of a non-feudal society where you know those things uh, this uh, um, writing techniques and um, and tools fundamentally are and uh, and items are produced only when cavalry started to develop especially uh, um, a, a at a collective level uh, in terms of collective training where the, the individual horsemen were wealthy enough to practice this collective training much and much and this is how you know stirrups had been um, uh, spread into Europe together with the rather political and social transformations not because they magically popped out at one point and they everybody started to use it and it didn't really work like that um, because they hadn't thought it before it, it's absurd um, so here for an Irish warrior it was perfectly fine probably even and easy and, and much more probably widespread than we think to, to mount on horseback and just to move through it so it, it's not really something you have to consider in terms of were those guys capable of fighting on horseback rather was it convenient to fight on horseback that's really where you, where you should orientate your thought um, towards um, and they um, the Irish however they had um, they had some s sort of cautions as well for uh, in substitution of the saddle seemingly and um, a um, instead of spores they use a sort of stick with a crook at its upper hand um, this horse road uh, called in uh, in the local language I think egg flesh uh, I don't know whether I'm pronouncing correctly it's e g h uh, f l e s g c sorry um, and uh, yeah and uh, also most of Irish horses were actually imported from Britain this is important uh, you know that not even Britain itself was particularly famous for for horses traditionally but the Normans had imported some uh, breeds from there the Andalusian the Berber horse etc also William the Conqueror had etc so now uh, that feudal society was developing a pool of horses even in, in a land where traditionally this hadn't doubled particularly and the Irish were buying them from from Britain now from them and in this period um, as we were saying before between the 14th and 15th century these tactics were pretty much still out there mm -hmm. um, the, the also the the, the socio-economical structures and the, as well as the political ones were pretty much the same these clans fighting competing for being kind of r rising to, to power over the others etc etc et um, the main uh, the quickest way to seize power was cattle riding as we were saying um, there were woodland or marsh, uh, marshland ambushes carried out uh, on a regular base the famous barricades of interwoven undergrowth or fell trees being erected across tracks as normally um, and um, the um, there is a proof that this went on essentially from both from uh, there is a um, Frasa Chronicle in the 14th century is one of the most famous sources in general about warfare between France and the Britain etc et um, and in, in this source there is an account of Harry Crystal who was an esquire that was captured by the Irish at the end of, of the um, in, in the 50s of the 14th century and in here uh, Henry relates how the enemy enters uh, that when the enemy enters in 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 their country the Irish draw used to draw together in narrow places and passes and defend them mm -hmm. so that no man may enter and when they see their chance they will get the better out of the enemies for they know the country um, and um, uh, and are light of foot for a man at arms however well mounted and however fast he may ride the Irishman will run as fast on foot and even overtake him and leap up on his horse behind and pull him off now this uh, this source is very very interesting because it gives you this um, idea that 
fundamentally there was this defensivistic attitude um, in uh, in tactics in Irish tactics um, the, the the idea that whoever entered here we're not even talking about tactics proper this can be extended even to uh, to strategy in general I mean there was no need for the Irish to move uh, in open ground and meet the enemy directly even you know in its own land there was this attrition that was carried out along the way on the advanced enemies fundamentally uh, creating this uh, uh, um, here it says the, the the Irish drew together so they kind of made mass and they concentrated into the narrow places and passes in order to defend them so this is both tactical and strategically uh, uh, definable because uh, it's obvious that also in this um, medieval Irish uh, landscape there were very few passages fundamentally that could be exploited even strategically speaking where armies were kind of obliged to, to, to cross and therefore defending them was was fundamental and uh, they so and here it says so that no man may enter so here there is the the idea that there is an outside and, uh, and an inside um, and um, and 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 the Irish are waiters in here, so they wait uh, for the the best chance to to the better chance to to arrive and to overcome the enemies in this way. Um, after presumably having in fact worn them down most of the times, um, and the they know the country, which is kind of um, you know it's not just because. Whoever lives is in, all, is in, all, in his own country knows his country. <laughs> but here it means that there was an additional knowledge that eventually was um, proper of these uh, warriors in the in the environment where where they had grown. I mean, a burger that lives in one of the most developed cities of Europe at this time doesn't give much about his country in terms of. Uh, terrain and doesn't know where to set up ambushes or where to meet an enemy if you live in the country uh, side because you are in fact also Ireland has a very few cities and you you're a farmer you're a peasant you're you just specialize in fact in cattle raiding you you perfectly know what what the ter the terrain is about and you know where's the, the best spot to to meet an enemy eventually in this sense so this means that there were Warriors definitely had a very good understanding of how things worked on the field in this wild um, environment and on how to exploit it, this, this knowledge. Um, here also the other remark, they are light of, of foot. Mm -hmm. So they, they have this light infantry that is also speedy. Um, so it can move quickly. This is also never to to forget. I mean, m moving an army that is tendentially lightly, when not completely, un uh, lightly armored, if not completely unarmored, also poses uh, way less logistical problems than, say, you know, a feudal army that has all the armor, all the spare horses, war horses that also consume a freaking lot of water, f uh, forage, and so on. So they. This means that the Irish armies were also capable of. Uh, first of all, they were smaller in terms of individual, I mean, in terms of leadership. They probably lacked, ten, tended to lack cohesion because these clans kind of stuck together only when there was an evident threat, like a major invasion. So they had a common interest, but for the rest, they also probably came, uh, like, you know, from from everywhere, literally, literally, kind of moving each one on their own. Knowing to providing to their own logistics, uh, knowing how to foraging on their own. Uh, this can this is kind of typical of the Middle Ages, but I, I want to stress that it in this context was more pronounced uh, compared to to other, especially considering other the military of other peoples uh, of other kingdoms, etc. That were kind of more organized and needed a greater uh, logistical, uh, a greater supply train, for instance. So it, it is difficult even to organize such a thing in a country like that at this point. So even these the 
the political fragmentation is kind of functional even to this kind of problems and a consequence in part to it and and, and therefore uh, i think as a result this um massing together with this drawing together but that the the author reports um is kind of as if this irish armies could materialize all together in these points from literally from nowhere so that they they were drawn from everywhere from all the various clans and uh, and therefore they were even more difficult to uh, to it was more difficult to prevent their uh, their reunion let's say this their gathering so and and you had to deal singularly with them if you wanted to attack kind of the source of these troops um then he says, for 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 a man eight arms, however well mounted and however fast he may ride. Oh, this is also particularly interesting. The Irishman will run as fast on foot and even overtake him, and leap up on his horse behind him and pull behind and pull him off. So this is uh, we will find other uh, other quotes from this from the 14th century that state in fact the the Irish speed also at an individual level. I mean, the Irish were very fast runners. And here it says, in fact, that uh, uh, these uh, Irish warriors could even run as fast as horses and literally jumping on, on, on knights on horseback and pulling them off. Um, this is uh, partially exaggerated because... Um, Obviously, a horse runs faster th than a, than an individual, than a, than a human being. But you have to consider the factors that kind of tended to decrease this dif this difference in speed. First of all, the Irish were light; they uh, lightly armored, were not unarmored. They knew the terrain. They were also probably you know, relatively fit in shape. They were kind of um, used to this physical exertions and living in, in, in the wild, having a very physical um, lifestyle, let's say, in terms of uh, forts, etc. So they, they, were, they were used to run, and to run on this specific terrain. Um, the, the horsemen here, um, Um, he says it doesn't matter however well mounted so here maybe I, I'm not sure but maybe so aside from the speed here it may be talking about even kind of what kind of mount is is using um, so I'm not entirely sure whether he's referring to the quality of the mount that can be uh, even a heavier horse or maybe here's talking about even the equipment in part I don't know however the, the obvious fact is what we were stating before about the heavier knights hmm? uh, since here um, yeah the, the the heavier knights especially were disadvantaged because uh, war horses tendentially are the ones that uh, well not really ran the uh, the slowest because actually also this idea that the majority of uh, knights horses were kind of heavy stallions or something like that um, is false usually uh, the the average were kind of runners or if not runners something halfway between um, that of a faster more agile horses could put the the enemy the the, the horsemen out of trouble more quickly um, but it's obvious that if this are if this knight is armored and it's already heavy on its own, etc. And and it has to run, especially on this tough terrain. Well, maybe there is an edge, mm. an advantage than a skilled Irish warrior knowing his terrain can can have on this uh, on these horses. Mm. So obviously, the average horse and horseman kind of runs mounted uh, faster. Than the uh, even than the average Irish warrior, but here evidently it was noticed that after all the the environmental conditions were such for which often uh, you could um, overrun, uh, you could outrun, sorry, a, a horseman just by running if you were, uh, but uh, if if you were trained enough. Uh, 
having thought in this, uh, being used to finding this as a kind of situations. They, um, the same source, by the way, states that the Irish scatter and hide themselves in bushes, woods, hedges, and even caves, so that no man can find them. Uh, also in here, the the idea that uh, these troops can attack and eventually disappear all of a sudden, taking refuge in these various, even natural um, shelters, is uh, is pretty important, because at that point, who is that knows about the local caves or or uh, stuff like that? I mean, uh, knowing the terrain here uh, means that these warriors were were uh, definitely um, so well fitting. Um, I mean, they were so well used to this kind of um, eventuality to take refuge and to, to avoid combat, because that was actually the main thing. You know, if you're likely armored if, or unarmored, there is no reason for you to expose yourself in front. You have to find a way out easily. You throw wh whatever you have in your hands, stones, javelins, and then you disappear. And that's the best you can do, because you can throw at the enemy what you have, and then not being hurt, getting out of there. Uh, this is typical of so many, so many cultures, so many warfare in, in, in many ways. There is another account uh, from 1375 um, about uh, the Battle of Fo uh, Fogart in 1318. The Battle of Fogart, if I pronounce it correctly by the way, is, the, uh, is fundamentally the end of um, Edward the Bruce campaign into Ireland. Fundamentally after after Bannockburn, for years before, when the Scots had kind of achieved their 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 autonomization from from England, they their independence. Uh, uh, Robert the Bruce sends his brother to Ireland to kind of mess up things for the English there. So obviously, the war was fought. Uh, I mean, the Scots actually invaded Ireland, but naturally, as it always happened when fighting in there, wherever you were, you had part of local Irish troops that kind of fought for you and another part, another side was fighting against you either as a f kind of free Irish uh, clan or maybe siding with the English or usually th there was this natural p polarization for for obvious reasons and, and interests and the Battle of Fogart is particularly important because it, it marks the end uh, not just of uh, the Scottish uh, campaign into Ireland, but also of Edward the Bruce's uh, life, because he was killed and his army annihilated uh, at, uh, uh, by the Irish, Irish uh, at, at the Battle of Fogart. So, in this account by Barber, um, there is an Irishman that speaks, let's say, about uh, the same Irish tactics and says, our manner of fighting in this country is to follow and fight, and fight running battles, and not to stand in plain melee until one side or the other is discomfited. So this phrase is beautiful because it perfectly exemplifies uh, all uh, the the the, tacti the 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 tactical mode that the Irish employed, basically by by standard. So here is. The idea is fighting in this country um, has to be done by following and fighting, and fighting running battles. Hmm? So here you, it gives you the, the movement that, that happening here, the mobility, the fluidity, the dynamism. Hmm? Naturally, you have to think that lacking a central um, institution, a um, like even feudal um, uh, lordships and, and stuff like that, the the overall collective training of these Irish armies was were ra was rather low. Basically, every clan fought on its own, or what, if there was a, a greater coordination, it was really uh, probably not very stable, not not very solid, as you can imagine. So, this is 
this idea of shifting the uh, the uh, the the dynamism at an individual level is a perfectly uh, good indicator of this lack of collective training because probably at a you know company level probably every, everybody knew what what to do because there were that was the real core at that point the uh, the, the real unit that carry out the the greater tactical effort and then what happened in the highest ranks was kind of more uh, foggy to follow and therefore this idea of running consistently basically was a compensation for the lack of greater maneuvers that could effectively you know uh, um, had made uh, larger units moving in a more coordinated fashion and therefore this idea of, of that even the individual warrior was the one that physically had to move back and forth during the fight to to figure out how the battle had to be won was very very important so just imagine uh, it, it it also presents you uh, uh, with with several tactical difficulties uh, from the other side because it's true this is just uh, like a rabble of uh, of runners of skirmishers and stuff like that but as soon as you advance this thing withdraws and even you know maybe uh, you have to watch out because if you go to too much ahead you're going to be surrounded on the flanks and these guys are throwing everything at you in terms of bullets of any kind so a projectiles and so that is a risk and it's something you don't want it uh, you don't want to happen that's why in fact the uh, the english partly perhaps i think also this cause had dealt with these troops by targeting them at the distance so that they could outshoot them um, and causing and, and basically yeah uh, de depleting their numbers simply by you know not letting uh, on the distance without having to cope directly with in melee with them because it would have been very very complicated and you would have needed fundamentally at that point another type of of light troops either mounted or or dismounted that that had to to respond them in the same exact way and uh, by approximation we can say that every naturally every army at this point um, had this kind of lighter troops that surrounded the heavier ones that were meant chiefly for pursuing or skirm skirmishing and pursuing uh, and so on but one thing was having you know uh, you know one tenth one one fifth of the army made up of the, these lighter troops Another thing is having, you know, like 95, 90% uh, of your army with all these massive troops. Mm -hmm. um, also, given that, obviously, a, uh, especially maybe in Scotland, there were more of this kind of skirmishers, definitely, especially in certain areas in the least um, Normanized, let's say, in fact, in the islands, as. Uh, as we have seen also in that other video, um, but in the case of England, it was arguably also difficult to find this more uh, kind of uh, gentrified uh, w English society, someone who was so active and so dynamic and so trained to fight uh, as the Irish were on in in that style, and um, so. Uh, it was a matter of mass, a matter of experience, a matter of of quality. Given that the you know the aim of that that the tactical task they had, and and that was that is what brings fundamentally war always to be uh, at this time in history. Mm, very less, uh, you know, very few so mm, asymmetric than than we can imagine. Even in this. Um, context uh, that as we said before you have essentially two relatively you know substantially different systems facing where where the asymmetry is even maybe higher than the usual um but uh you i think you you got the concept more or less and and here also it, it is explicitly said that our manner of fighting is not to stand in plain melee until one side or the other is discomfited. So here th there is an explicit statement that basically melee, plain melee, has to be avoided. 
until one or side or the other is, is discomfited. So, especially, so meaning fundamentally that uh, you could be defeated at that point, even by skirmishing on the distance, which which is kind of normal. Also, because think this from a this is an Irishman speaking. So he was not just now the Battle of Fulgard was this major victory against the Scots, but as we were saying before, the Irish mostly fought um, as against each other. So just imagine that they were used to counter enemies that that use the same tactics normally. So it's obvious that at that point, yeah, of course some melee happened in, in any way. Even the skirmishers engage in some sort of melee at a certain point, but it's not their favorite <laughs> part of the story. Um, but in this sense, most of the battles probably exhausted themselves without even reaching a massive melee, simply by skirmishing on the distance, wounding, killing, and, um, and causing uh, losses without, without getting even to a conclusive... Um, I mean, especially in, in things like cattle raiding and so on, these were probably kind of um, lightning uh, operations. Of course, in larger battles, it was kind of easier to determine who had won or not, because in, the, in, in those battles, kind of the masses bring to a, to more, at least quantitatively, drastic results. So that the uh, it's also easier to to actually if you break a wall formation to to cut into these fleeing troops and massacre and butchering them down, um, and so on. And this is why, incidentally, they. Um, the, the the Irish preferred not <laughs> to expose themselves in open ground and simply to remain tr entrenched in, into the woods and marshlands and so on. So going back to the English spe specifically, uh, how did the English cope with these tactics when they established their um, their uh, their uh, let's say foot uh, you know did their better quarters in, in Ireland and kept uh, and kept them under control and having to cope constantly with the local nobility that in part also sided with them um, and had interests etc. So they there is a, a, um, a definitely a, a hybrid uh, that that takes place. The, um, the the simplest solution was to adopt a similar strategy in general to, to the uh, to the Irish one. So, um, consider that the English remain in here, kind of forever. So they, they also the local English settlers kind of historically transformed a little bit. They remained usually distinguished from the rest of the from from Gael, the Gaelic society, but in part they were naturally influenced, and in they. Uh, they they learn to to fight in their own style. So the strategy of raiding and burning uh, that was uh, followed by the Irish was definitely adopted by the English in at the same time. Uh, not that the English didn't do it by standards or any other army uh, for at the time for that that matter. But this uh, kind of um, um, guerrilla. Um, tactics and uh, scorched earth, uh, earth um, policy and um, these uh, blitz uh, raids the, it, they were pretty much out there by, by standard also because they were carried out literally by the same people I mean there were the same Irishmen fighting for the English at this point in part so it was so easy to, to, to do it um, and there, and this was a very swift and cheap uh, way to exert pressure on the enemy. At the same time, so um, there was also a tendency to use small field forces. Actually, there was no need to venture out there in Ireland with these massive armies because that was kind of the best way to 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 lose more resources in proportion than than using smaller uh, units that were kind of more agile, more fast moving, and they were more adapted to the local um, uh, scenario. So um, the the best combination was sometimes an all-mounted contingent. 
uh, made up of uh, men at arms and mounted archers. It was particularly effective. Uh, you know that by the 14th and 15th century, um, not just England but also other countries in Europe take Burgundy. Uh, uh, they, uh, but even Germany or Italy or kind of everywhere, uh, the, there was a um, spread of mounted bowmen, whether they were actually archers or mounted archers or crossbowmen. Um, the the English made extensive use, as you know, of, of longbowmen in general, and these were pretty pretty flexible. We mostly remember longbowmen for you know their massive pitched battles, the uh, where they were dismounted, they they met the French in open ground. But uh, throughout all the rest of operations, uh, like scouting, um, you know, shielding the army and uh, etc., you know, it was mostly these lighter troops that that had the the upper hand. Um, and using horse archers was particularly effective, as always, because you can carry out this um, hit and run tactics that are extremely effective. Um, and in in there, in fact, the objective is not to to reach. Malay, but simply to attack the enemy at the distance, being quickly moving, fast moving, etc. So, Ireland, especially by standard, was a perfect land to carry out such tactics. Um, and in fact, uh, these men at arms and mounted archers contingents were extremely, they turned out to be extremely effective. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, um, they kind of compensated. Um, um, the they they kind of compensated the um, the missile component because you had men, you know the main problem when the English had arrived is that they were largely feudal you know heavy heavy cavalrymen so now they they lack the uh, they 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 lacked tendentially I this is obviously approximated but they tended to lack uh, missile troops, usually feudal, uh, feudal armies didn't have quite a massive amount and, until uh, at least crossbowmen spread, and in the case of the English, uh, for reasons that actually have very few to do with with the relation with Ireland, um, started to develop this um, uh, mass use of longbowmen. Um, th there were a, a very few uh, missile troops. Um, this is also relatively ideal because this stemmed chiefly for from from cultural reasons like that the feudal elite considered in the ancient ideal fashion of the heroic uh, wa uh, warfare the, the idea of hitting someone on the distance to be cowardly mm. unmanly you know the true man had to go there with his sword and cutting the chopping the enemy to pieces uh with his own hand, um, but, but we know, as a matter of fact, that horse archery was probably way more developed than we think in Western Europe. Uh, if anything, because all these aristocrats that made up the heavier uh, cavalry uh, in feudal society uh, were also hunters. I mean, that was their favorite sport in hunting. In that sense, it's not very different from war in many ways. So they perfectly knew how to use a bow from horseback. So simply, they they didn't propagandate that much uh, in in the official sources. Nevertheless, these numbers are increased evenly to cope with this chiefly missile uh, armies that uh, existed in Ireland. And uh, at the same time, they. So they compensate the lack of missile troops, but they, um, uh, let's say, they expand in, in, in the direction in which they, they had a greater edge, that is, the use of cavalry, that, as we have seen in Ireland, wasn't much uh, widespread. So in here you had a missile potential, a mounted uh, uh, component that is also both... Um, a heavy and a light one, so that you have the heavily armored knight, the man at arms that is uh, not out there alone on horseback, but is surrounded by lighter troops like horse archers that can protect him and avoid, you know, in fact, those runners that we have seen in the previous f source 
to to literally pull him out of, of horseback by running along him and uh and so they they kind of try to, to compensate in this way all the problems and naturally you can imagine also this uh, for the irish it was uh kind of um as always preferable not to be caught in the open by such um parties um also they as we've seen that there was a very few armor in ireland so even kind of attacking one one fully armored knight at this time in history during the 14th the 15th century when but played armor develops consistently is kind of madness unless you don't have some other mean um, in fact even this idea of pulling a knight off of horseback is kind of important because you you know you basically shock him you you know just think about the impact with the ground falling from horseback in and also the relative um in agility that you have when you wear an armor because yeah we all know that actually armors were way uh um you know they were built very uh, re for, for granting the highest mobility as possible in fact men at arms in their full plate armor could make the all the kind of imaginable um um acrobatics fundamentally but it's still weighted so now you don't have to just believe um to 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 bring the thing to to the opposite extreme when you bust a myth you still have to think that that armor was pretty heavy uh, and it's difficult to to find in it and you have to be well trained well used to this form of exertion you also have a kind of a autonomy to for for your organism to be able to f fight um at length in, into a full plate armor so even when you're brought down on the ground and you need in there uh you know several people who um you know, it can even be unarmored but that can have uh, get the 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 upper hand because you are hampered in movements and they can i don't know uh, put you a stock in the neck where in a few places where you're not well armored and so on so th that is, these are types of fights that that happen in that time the word galloping actually increasingly you know the, the the fight could be also very very physical but let's say that um when it, when you're talking about units formations etc we generally you know you if you're if you're a, have if you're very lightly armored or unarmored completely unarmored well you tend not to meet an armored opponent in open field you try to wear him down to to exhaust him because that's actually the the ultimate aim uh you know it's not necessarily that you have to 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 defeat someone simply by hurting him you can also starve starve him to death if you block him for instance in, in a forest where he can't get out without struggling against against these barricades and so on that exhaust him he can as well surrender maybe maybe he's not even wounded but he is hungry his thirsty and uh, you can easily capture him at that point so this is this is real war and this is why you know technology for instance is just one of the many factors and sometimes it's even virtually uh, in influence in certain occasions um so what else can we say the Uh, Henry Crystal describes also how um, the in um, when he was captured by the Irish that the English archers began to shoot so keenly that the Irish could not withstand it. Therefore, they recoiled and turned uh, back. Uh, in, in that occasion, when he eventually was uh, captured himself, it was an ambush. So he, he here, uh, we're talking about the the 14th century now. The English made extensive use of of crossbowmen, and uh, here it doesn't say doesn't specify. I think the, what kind of archers, but yeah, they were usually crossbowmen. So here it also gives you the idea that even in, in an ambush, in fact, where usually spaces maybe are not so. Um, so large but it was enough sometimes 
for the for just other light troops like uh, archers to shoot um, with their bows to kind of uh, make it ir becoming irresistible for the Irish because they were so lightly armored. Um, so even at close range, uh, th this gives you the the measure of how much in, in to fight. Um, everything is done, not just throwing yourself out there in the danger without any, um, you know, any way to, w without caring about your, 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 uh, I hate when I lack words, your safety, your integrity. So, um, at this point, even during an ambush, it was enough to make the uh, the Irish recalling and turning back by shooting them with bows, which they even uh, kind of lacked at least in the measure the the English had at that point historically. Um, however, there are also other occasions, including including the same battle of Fogarth that we have seen, into which the Irish were kind of prepared to stand up against the the enemy in open battle. And even against, in fact, in, like in that case, uh, well, not in that case, but uh, even against the English in some times. Um, so, in fact, um, there is one source from the Battle of Fulgard with, which uh, expressly says that Irish troops managed to withstand uh, the fire of Birmingham's archers without breaking. And then, when the actually the the enemy had exhausted its ammo, its ammunition, its arrows, so waiting to to take all all of it, fundamentally, they also managed to charge and rout them. So this is particularly interesting because um, also from from the other videos, we 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 kind of stressed the the vulner the Irish vulnerability to to arrows. Sometimes even in the 12th century, um, the the Welsh bowman hand caused massive uh, casualties into the Gaelic armies um, uh, at the time. Um, at this point, in the in the in the fourteenth century, in the, at the beginning of fourteenth century, seemingly uh, the arrow fire wasn't so uh, dreaded by the Irish anymore. That yeah, tendentially still preferred not to have much with it, as we've seen before. Also, with the, during that ambush, with when Crystal was 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 taken prisoner, but it, it could happen. In fact, in battles, in battles, it's uh, it can be generally the more um, you know. I don't know what the factors can be. Naturally, these are accounts that have a very relative uh, value because they don't give us the, the actual strengths involved in the, into the process. But it's obvious that in a fight like an ambush, maybe you are even on the closer range and uh, at an individual level, it's, you tend to be more, um, you know, the single contingent tends to be more fearful and um, of uh, of uh, damages, you know, on a, 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 a smaller scale, you know, individual uh, dynamics are kind of different from formation dynamics. So it's possible that in, at the Battle of Fulgard, uh, the Fulgard, the the Irish kind of suffered very heavy losses in, in there, but they still were maybe uh, enough um, to to maintain the control of the field. After all, no army. Historically, ever won just with with uh, with bows. You know that you perfectly know that even the English tactics of the under of the Hundred Years' War were, you know, functioning because there were men at arms together with with bowmen. It's not that bowmen alone, even if they were in thousands, literally, um, could do anything on their own. Um, so, no army was actually defeated just because of arrow fire. So it kind of makes sense, but this is kind of meaningful because still, the Irish were known for being generally worse armored than the others. So even in fact they withstood and they had the strength after the enemy had, had thrown at them literally all the ammunition that it, they had, they were able to to charge and to defeat the enemy. So this is this is kind of important because it tells you even about the the hardness of certain. 
uh, a certain warriors that probably were um, in their kind of wilder um, uh, you know background were were kind of more used even to to the physical sufferings and stuff like that not that humans are you know that this is kind of virtually influent but you know being battle hardened uh, clansman who has uh, you know spent all his life into this kind of cattle reigning warfare etc makes you perhaps a bit more physically uh, insensitive to certain things you kind of get used um, that's also a kind of more than a physical thing and really a psychological thing because you're more used so you're kind of more willing to get into it whereas I don't know uh a Scottish farmer that still maybe leaves to to a town and is more kind of kind of better off and doesn't fight every day maybe has kind of forgotten progressively even though you know in fact also uh, there were many differences within Scotland itself that st- still retained uh, as well part of this um, hardness in at the individual level. Um, Talking about raids, um, at the siege of Rouen in uh, 1418, du- during the Hundred Years' War, the English used um, Irish troops, uh, Irish auxiliaries, um, um, to to keep the army supplied with meat by exploiting their uh, raiding expertise. So that they, the Irish, in this way, were very functional of you know, finding out enemy cattle since they were used to do it at home literally all the time. And um, this, these are also factors that, that kind of function. It tells you in this case in, in that, you know, every unit is kind of used for what it can do best. So these were Irishmen in English service and they, they were, the English used them exactly for the work, what they were better at, at doing fundamentally. So, um, at the end of this um, video, we can naturally we can't avoid to talk about the Galog like a little bit because um, these were instead troops that um, were kind of the other way around tendentially. I mean, even Galog lakes were definitely used to get into into guerrilla warfare, in skirmishes, and so on. Um, this hasn't to do much with the we, with individual level, but rather with the unit level. I mean, uh, how large is that unit, and with, with many hundred units, do, do, does it fight in which context, and so on. So definitely, even the Galog like could skirmish pretty effectively, not just using his uh, double hand sword, uh, like they they were being developed at this point. But there are later accounts of these um, kind of units that, as we have seen, were now spreading quite consistently into Ireland, and even natives uh, were to be found uh, increasingly into them, uh, do not likely abandon the field, but bite the brunt to the death. Mm. So there was this also relatively ideal uh, picture of the Gallog Lake actually sending his ground to the death, uh, chopping enemy to pieces, and it's not really far from reality, actually, because that's what that kind of unit was literally conceived for, and we know from, yeah, okay, from later accounts, it maybe had to stress the glory of their ancestors and their uh, warlike, uh, you know, de- the, the, their war deeds and and fierce character that, yeah, they, they literally threw themselves into the the, the melee into the midst of battle, kind of chopping enemies to pieces, and it is kind of true, even given their equipment, that fundamentally re- reveals you that these were professional butchers. Uh, but um, uh, yeah, these uh, kind of units um, were the ones that would remain on the field, um, would remain on the field for for many reasons, actually for money, but also for political involvement, because as we have seen generally. These um, uh, better equipped um, warriors were tendentially also not just desperados that were out there, like you know, no ones that uh, just did it for money. They were they were actually also clansmen. They were chieftains. So naturally, they were doing it for money, as everyone else. 
but it also had other forms of interest. Uh, they also had properties to defend, they were politically committed. And in this sense, th this gives you the reason why they were kind of standing uh, to the death, because they had kind of higher reason than the average uh, tribal levy that maybe was killed in cattle ra raiding and this uh, continuous local um, warfare, you know, raiding warfare and so on, but it wasn't maybe so you know, willing to go to die for the local chieftain, as much as the chieftain instead was uh, more interested into profiting from, uh, because he managed the whole community, had far-ranging interests and so on. Uh, so this is also a factor to consider that um, training and discipline in this Irish armies was generally very low. Uh, we're not talking about individual prowess and capability, because that also was a way to compensate, in part, that lack of collective training and discipline, but um, they were generally also re re relatively um, unruly armies that it was even difficult to kind of gather uh, at, at some point, because there was all the political negotiation be behind this that definitely uh, could took a, a lot of time and this time Ireland was chronically fragmented in many ways and um, that's kind of normal and and that's why also by the way the fundamentally they uh, they progressively lost ground to to more cohesive uh, political entities like England etc because if they had been united probably they, they they could have wiped out a foreign presence on on the island pretty easily but you know that they were it was not their interest because all they cared about was their own clan and maybe yeah that, that was it fundamentally um the And, uh, and in fact, we have evidence actually of Gallag Lakes in several battles uh, deploying, um, dr being drawn up in close order, and engaging the enemy in such a fashion. So yeah, that this existed definitely. And uh, and, and as we were saying before, this starts intensifying mostly into this 14th, especially 15th century. We find uh, an ever uh, larger number of Gallag Lakes that is actually of Irish origin. But you can find this actually even before into Irish history from the uh, kind of the origins in some way from the Iron Age and you know even before. So um, now this was intensifying also because probably there were also the same uh, Irish politics and society was creating a bit um, was kind of developing more consistent you know, political entities, there were clans that now were kind of progressively rising to the top and also developing, in this sense, a uh, larger amount of, um, of retinues, some of, some of which were also, in this sense, progressively better armed and also in the kind of the uh, English or continental fashion. So this was perfectly uh, feasible. Most of the the uh, weapon imports definitely were from England, but also from the continent. So, yeah. Um, also from Scotland, probably. Um, that in turn bought them from... At that point, chiefly, given that they were at war with England pretty often, they probably also from other markets, like, I don't know, from Flanders or somewhere else. And um, in fact, most of uh, most of the blades that you find, even in the claimers and stuff like that, were of uh, of German origin. Sometimes, because that's where they they bought them from. Um, sometimes they bought the, just a blade, and then eventually they they mounted the hilt in in uh, uh, in Britain. So it was perfectly perfectly feasible. The uh, there is a, we can close with a last mention to the under let's say the overlooked Irish cavalry that is still kind of still existed <laughs> after all and 
Um, and interestingly enough, there is a comparison that you can draw in terms of the tactics that were carried out by this Irish cavalry that were pretty similar uh, to the ones of the uh, Iberian uh, Hinetes, actually, because that that was it. It was a, essentially a fr Ireland, so a fr consistent frontier warfare that was similar to many other uh, you know, contexts that existed in the rest of Europe. Definitely this uh, skirmishing capacity uh, in of hitting and hitting uh, and running tactics were hit and run tactics were were was definitely there and was pretty similar to these other cavalrys you could find in other areas of Europe and uh, especially at the borders of of feudal Europe proper because this is it when you you, you can't there is this macro interpretation that you can make of feudal warfare in Europe in the, during the Middle Ages, that there, there was a sort of boundary of this um, of this world. You know, wh wherever the feudal world sees, you start finding this kind of lighter troops. And this is true for the Celtic fringe and the British archipelago, uh, but this is true for uh, all the other frontiers, the, the Iberia, the Baltic, uh, the Near East. So, uh, there is always this kind of encounter between the feudal armies with heavier cavalry, uh, better uh, shaped um, logistical systems, and, and so on. With also with a higher with, with a higher degree of um, uh, control unity of the army, so that there is a kind of a vertical a vertical society which has a king, for instance. That that kind of controls a bureaucracy, a system, a, a tax system, a recruitment system, etc. So that can di direct and control these um, units better. Uh, and then this kind of still fundamentally tribal world, if you want that, uh, or clanic world, if you prefer. But that, that that was essentially it. That is much more fragmented, has lighter troops, and uh, has to rely on this kind of tactics because hit and run tactics because there is no way to no advantage actually to to meet the enemy in other fashions given the resources that you have at your disposal in that specific context um, in the case of the um, Irish cavalry definitely there was a lot of um, uh, throwing or trusting uh, javelins o over arm that is kind of standard for every kind of skirmishing cavalry the Normans had even because usually even heavy cavalry can do that as we all know but uh, the in here for instance if you take the English they, they had kind of stopped doing it by roughly by the 12th century uh, as a standard tactics at least because actually knights have always kind of uh, used their lances in the all the uh, imaginable ways at all times in history. Uh, so never think that there was a standard, a fixed standard usage of weapons because even today you can find assault rifles used as clubs <laughs> during fights when things get messed up. Um, but you see that, uh, you know, an 11th century Norman cavalryman, as well armored as ca could be, as still very well collectively trained and able to perform charges and so on, uh, trusting, uh, uh, you know, with direct grip, etc. Um, usually, ran, ran in front of the enemy uh, formations and and threw these uh, javelins, um, hurled these javelins to kind of soften up the enemy ranks before charging. See ha Hastings, for instance. Um, then progressively, this idea of using javelin kind of loses of uh, functionality in the feudal world because at that point. The most important thing is carrying out the charge more effectively, and there is this uh, weightening of the armor, uh, etc. So at that point, you just need a lance that you keep very firmly under your armpit, and you try to, to smash in, into the enemy formations like that. Um, while these lighter troops, these lighter cavalry in, in, in this um, Celtic fringe, tended not wanting to go into melee, as we've seen, as much as infantry, uh, to just throw javelins. So you can argue that fundamentally there wasn't much of a difference between uh, Irish 
cavalrymen and infantrymen. Sometimes, as always in history, also they were the same thing, the same people actually, who mounted and dismounted given the the need. And uh, so, yeah, that's what you mostly see. Yet, there is still a tiny elite um, of clansmen that is able, as we have seen, to uh, buy uh, this Western um, armor and to... Um, at that point it's not just a military thing. I mean, obviously this would trigger the the fight of the specif specific noble um, in a more similar fashion to the Western one. But um, at that point it's also a fashionable thing to do, a political thing to do. I mean, you want to look more just like, you know, let's imagine like you're, you're an Irish clansman who has interest with the English. Or, or that, yeah, maybe he's always in kind of, even still strained relations with them, but still wants to appear more acceptable, more, um, more alike to them, to be, uh, even to be feared or to be admired. And he starts wearing, as a matter of fact, a, um, a full feudal panoply, even though he actually doesn't own much of, you know, castles or, or land or doesn't have a feudal system develop for real into into Ireland. By the way, at this time, yeah, feudalism is also exported into Ireland, very slow, albeit very slowly and progressively, but there, e there are definitely Irish chieftains that start leaving kind of the, the English way uh, progressively, but uh, obviously there is a great difference when it comes to fielding units that function like, um, you know, the, the, the feudal ones without having a feudal society and that's the real problem and that's where you see structurally speaking the, the the main difference because you realize that you know if you don't have a feudal system you can fully have uh, you know things like a heavy cavalry uh, a functional heavy cavalry that can perform uh, charges and uh, you know in such an orderly fashion etc with such uh, smashing power shock power etc so um, that's pretty pretty obvious I try always to to present this information by um, framing it into into the broader picture because that's where it it makes sense because otherwise you just focus on weapons like on video games and it doesn't make any sense you have to understand this chiefly every military aspect has to be understood from a political and social point of view otherwise it's not history it's just you know something weird <laughs> and okay so, for now, I just hope that uh, you enjoyed this video. Uh, if you did, please share it, otherwise leave a like, or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming contents. And for now, I thank you heartily, uh, heartily sorry, for listening to me. I wish you a nice time, and see you next time. Bye.